York, a city steeped in history. In 72 AD, the Romans built a fortress here and ruled for more than 300 years. York was then invaded by the Anglo-Saxons, plundered by the Vikings, pillaged and almost destroyed by the Normans led by William the Conqueror, and eventually besieged by Cromwell in 1644. But York has survived these terrible traumas throughout the centuries, and perhaps nowhere in England is there such a fine collection of historic and beautiful buildings, old churches and ancient streets in what must be one of the best preserved medieval cities in the world. In the year 71 AD, a Roman army marched into Yorkshire, led by their commander, Quintus Batilus Cyrillius. He established a fortress here, built between two rivers, the Ouse and the Foss. This location was chosen by Cyrillius as both rivers were easily accessible from the sea, and both flowed extensively inland. The fortress was known as the Principia, This side street opposite the Minster led directly to the fortress. The Romans called their new settlement Eboracum, meaning Valley of the Yew Tree. This column, which forms part of the original Roman headquarters 1900 years ago, was excavated from the Minster Vaults in 1969. After its placement, it was discovered to be upside down and has remained that way ever since. The Romans built their bridge over the ooze here, where the present Guildhall now stands. This pedestrian street, known as Stonegate, was originally used by the Romans on the way to and from the Principia, the Roman fortress. While the Roman governor was establishing his headquarters at Aboricum, there were threats from a tribal group known as the Brigantes. During one incident, a battalion of Roman soldiers belonging to the 9th Legion were ambushed and killed. These attacks embarrassed the Roman commander. Eventually, Cyrillius marched his soldiers north. A further battle ensued, and this time the Brigantes were defeated. This Roman road north of York at Gothland would have been used by the 9th Legion during this period. Further evidence of Roman occupation is evident here at Alborough, a small village 20 kilometers northwest of York. Situated in the museum gardens is the Matangular Tower. This tower was the southwestern corner of the Roman fortress. The lower portion of the tower still retains the original Roman structure. The exterior was repaired and rebuilt during Norman and medieval times. These stone coffins unearthed in various parts of York were carved by Roman masons and reserved for the members of the elite 9th Legion.
Early in the 5th century, the Roman Empire began to crumble. The 9th Legion, which had inhabited York for nearly 300 years, was recalled to Rome, never to return. Following the departure of the Romans, very little is known about York over the next 200 years, a period referred to as York's Dark Age. The next invaders were tribesmen from Northern Europe who descended from the north of England. These people were the Anglo-Saxons. They called their new settlement Euphoric, meaning market town. They introduced Christianity to the area. This Anglican tower, discovered in 1969, was constructed in a breach in the original Roman wall. The tower now incorporates four earthen mounds, Roman, Anglo-Saxon, Norman and Medieval. During the Anglo-Saxon reign, King Edwin ruled here. In 627 AD, Edwin became a Christian and on the day of his baptism, he built a small wooden church on the site of the present York Minster. Several years later, Edwin himself was killed in a battle in 633 AD near Doncaster. The Anglo-Saxon reign, which had lasted for 400 years, would now be replaced. A new army from Scandinavia had landed on the Yorkshire coast. The Vikings had arrived. They sailed up the River Ouse in the winter of 866. The Viking boats were made of oak and they could sail in water just over one meter deep. A major battle ensued and many Anglo-Saxons were killed in the fight for York. Further violence erupted over the next few years. The Vikings eventually consolidated their position and renamed their new city Jorvik. Both sides came to terms with each other and the Vikings settled down to a more peaceful existence while always retaining the ability to strike terror in their enemies. By the 10th century, Jorvik was second in size only to London. Ships sailed from here to Viking settlements all over Europe, including Dublin and Ireland. This area on the Ouse became known as the Dublin Stones. The Vikings had ruled York for almost 200 years. By 1042, Anglo-Saxons were once again in control of the city. And 24 years later, news of an invading army from Norway reached King Harald. Harald marched his troops north. The Battle of Stamford Bridge was hard fought and there were many casualties on both sides. Harald was victorious, but three weeks later he was defeated in the Battle of Hastings by a more powerful force. Later, this was to have a huge influence on the city of York. The Normans had landed a well-equipped army led by William the Conqueror. Three months later, William was crowned King of England. In 1068, William and his troops arrived in York. During this time, William built his first wooden fort here at Bailey Hill. The Normans had now consolidated their position at York. The name Jorvik was changed to York, but the people were unhappy at King William's rule and made several attempts to oust him. William responded by having his troops burn farms and crops in the north of England. Many thousands died of starvation. Every dwelling in this beautiful vale of Yorkshire was destroyed in what became known as the Harrowing of the North. Standing on the site of William's second fort is this stone castle, Clifford's Tower. At that time, there was friction between Jewish and Christian communities and a riot was started by some local people who owed money to the Jews. The Jews took refuge in the wooden castle. Rather than surrender to the mob, they set fire to the castle and perished. This incident remains the most horrific event in York's history.
Clifford's Tower, originally known as York Castle, was named after Roger the Clifford, who was hanged here in the 14th century. The castle mound surrounded by a moat was filled with water from the River Foss. Subsequently, the tower began to subside and huge cracks appeared in the outer walls. These cracks are still visible today. Between 1642 and 1644, Cromwell's troops bombarded the tower from across the River Ouse. Medieval walls encircle most of the city. Standing on the earthen ramparts built by the Vikings, the walls which were started in 1250 took 50 years to complete. They were further strengthened during the reign of Henry III. Battlement towers were placed at regular intervals along the wall. Over 35 of these towers are still standing. This stretch of the wall at Lord Mayor's Walk provides magnificent views of York Minster. The four great bars or gates were the strongest points to the walls. They were built around 1200 AD and still dominate the main roads into the city. Monk Bar, the tallest of the four gateways, comprises of three floors. Stonework figures on the top of the bar pick men dropping stones on the enemy below. During medieval times, Monk Bar was used as a prison. From here, the wall leads to Bootham Bar, the only bar to stand on the site of the original Roman fort. The large Norman archway, dating from the 11th century, is the oldest entrance gate to the city. Bootham Bar still retains its original portcullis, visible here at Petergate. Stone figures carved in the 19th century replaced early ones erected during medieval times. From Lendl Bridge, the wall continues to Micklegate Bar. Dominating the road to the south, this entrance has been used by royalty down through the ages. Spiked heads were often displayed on top of the bar for long periods, although relatives sometimes managed to recover them. Wallam Gate Bar is the only gateway to retain its barbican. The barbican was a defensive corridor between the outer and inner entrance, where the enemy could be trapped and dealt with by various means, including the dropping of large stones from the walls above. The bar was damaged in 1489 and again during the Cromwellian siege of 1644. Bullet marks can still be seen on the face of the walls. The 12th century Norman archway bears the coat of arms of King Henry V.
This house within the bar was constructed in Elizabethan times. From Wallam Gate, the wall continues along Foss Islands Road to the Red Tower. Construction of the tower in 1490 caused much public controversy and led to the murder of the stonemason responsible, John Patrice. At Jubilee, King Henry II gave the Jews of York permission for their own burial ground. From here, the wall provides an attractive walk back to Monk Bar. Beside Monk Bar is this early 19th century dome building which was used to store ice from the River Ouse, enabling local fishmongers to keep fish for long periods. In the museum gardens are the ruins of St. Mary's Abbey, once covering an area of 13 acres. The ruins date from the 13th century. In those days, the abbey was very wealthy, as the abbot was responsible for collection of the local taxes. As a result, when violence flared up from time to time, walls, towers and battlements were built for the protection of the abbey. In the early 14th century, during the war with Scotland, King Edward II ruled from here. Here at Marygate, the abbey walls still retain wooden shutters similar to ones used for defensive purposes during the Middle Ages. On the dissolution of the monasteries in 1539, the abbey's wealth was transferred to the crown and the abbey was abandoned, never to be used again. During the siege of York in 1644, parliamentary soldiers placed gunpowder at the base of this tower at Marygate and blew it up. The soldiers then entered the abbey grounds and attacked royalists who were defending the city. In the wake of many casualties, the royalists regained control and captured several hundred soldiers, only to be freed again one month later when they themselves surrendered. By the 18th century, the abbey was stripped further off its stone for the repair of other churches in the area. All that remains today is the nave of the abbey church with the foundations of the remaining building. These majestic ruins serve as a reminder of one of England's richest and most important Benedictine monasteries. Church steeples and turrets are the dominant feature of York's skyline. It was said at one stage there was a church in York for every week of the year. Many of these churches have survived to this day. Some are mentioned in King William's Doomsday Book of 1086. This church, All Saints in High Oosgate, has an eight-sided lantern tower which during medieval times guided travelers from the nearby forests. This church has long been associated with the city guilds. It is said that 46 former Lord Mayors are buried here. An unusual feature on the north door of the church is this 12th century door knocker depicting the devil swallowing a woman's head. Holy Trinity Church at Good Ramgate is also worth a visit. This charming little church dates from the 13th century. It is situated behind York's oldest row of houses Lady Row Cottages, which date from the early 14th century. Set in a large churchyard, St. Margaret's Church in Wallamgate was mentioned in a charter around 1175. The porch of the doorway incorporates some splendid Norman craftsmanship, dating from 1155, taken from St. Nicholas Church nearby, St. Martin Le Grand Church here in Cooney Street 
was badly damaged in an air raid in 1942. This 15th century church now serves as a shrine of remembrance to those killed in the air raids. The church is easily identified by the large clock surmounted by the figure of the little admiral. The clock was first installed here in 1668. But the most magnificent church of all is the Church of St. Peter, the Mother Church of Northern England, York Minster. The Minster has dominated the city for nearly 800 years. Extensive renovations started in the early 1960s are still ongoing. A church has stood on this site since 627 AD. The present building was started in 1220 by Archbishop Walter de Grey and took more than 250 years to complete. Built on the site of the original Roman fortress, York Minster is the largest Gothic cathedral in England. These twin towers with their soaring pinnacles are the dominant feature at the west end of the Minster. The five sister windows in the north transept is the world's largest Grisaille window. There are over 100,000 pieces of glass contained in this unique masterpiece painted around 1360. In the south transept is the Great Rose Window, commemorating the end of the War of the Roses in 1486. It was badly damaged by fire in 1984. The restoration of this window, which suffered 40,000 cracks, is a tribute to the unique skill and patience of today's craftsmen. The great eastern window, installed around 1406, contains the largest single area of medieval glass in the world. The panel depicts the history of man from the beginning to the end. A short distance from here is Treasurer's House, where the treasurer of the Minster resided. Standing on the site of the original Roman barracks, the present building contains elements of architecture from the 13th to the 17th century. After the dissolution of monasteries and churches in 1539, the Minster's wealth was transferred to the Crown. Seven years later, the last treasurer, William Cliff, boldly resigned his position and complained that there being no treasure left, there would seem to be no need for a treasurer. Today, the treasurer's house is managed by the National Trust, and the Minster treasures are now the responsibility of the Dean. This majestic church of St. Peter is both a cathedral and a minster. The cathedral being a church with an archbishop's throne, and a minster being a center of Christian teaching. Only two archbishop's thrones in England, York and Canterbury. The archbishop's residence was never far from the Minster. Since the 13th century, archbishops of York have resided here at Bishopthorpe Palace on the River Ouse. During the Middle Ages, vessels approaching the palace would sound their guns aloft to signal that they were arriving and expected hospitality. The River Ouse has always played an important role in York's turbulent history. The name Ouse, meaning clear water, derives from Anglo-Saxon times. The present Ouse Bridge was completed in 1820 and is the third on this site. Beside Lendl Bridge is the Guild Hall, which has occupied this site since the 14th century. In 1942, the building was extensively damaged during an air raid. It was subsequently rebuilt and restored to its former glory. Just beyond Blue Bridge Lane is the spot where a lady dressed in white appears. Many years ago, she was murdered here. It is said that she returns regularly in search of her murderers.
The quayside is the ideal spot for visitors to relax and enjoy the views of the boats and cruisers as they make their way up and down the river. At Lendl Bridge, there are two towers, Barker Tower and Lendl Tower. These towers marked an entry point into the city by boat. A chain was stretched from one tower to the other to prevent enemy ships from entering. During the Middle Ages, the River Ouse was used to deliver stone for the construction of York Minster, which was then transported up this ancient street, Stonegate. This pedestrian street, dating from Roman times, is almost 2,000 years old. The street is dominated by the banner over York's oldest drinking establishment. Stonegate has also some fine examples of 14th and 15th century architecture. The street was also famous for its bookshops and printing establishments. This haunch figure is the Little Red Devil, once used to depict a printing house in operation here. There are several alleyways and side streets leading from here, including this one, Little Stonegate. Close by are the remains of the 12th century house, one of the earliest buildings of the Norman period. Stonegate is one of the many streets in York ending in the word gate, a Viking word for street. York has more gates than anywhere else in Britain and this term has survived ever since. This one, Whipman Whatman Gate, has the longest name but is York's shortest street. Not far from Stonegate is the world's famous shambles. This cobblestone street was once a center of butchers and meat sellers. Meat was suspended from these timber beams during medieval times. Metal hooks are still to be seen embedded in the wood. The stench must have been unbearable, particularly in the hot weather. Records show that disease and pestilence was common in these conditions. Some of these buildings are so close that it's possible to shake hands with your neighbor across the street. At number 35, the Shambles, is a shrine of Margaret Clithrow. Towards the end of the 16th century, she was accused of harboring Catholic priests. She refused to renounce her faith and was crushed to death in 1586 in a particularly gruesome form of Elizabethan execution. In 1970, she was canonized St. Margaret of York. In contrast, Dick Turpin, the notorious highwayman, fled from London to continue his life of crime in York. He was eventually caught and executed, and is buried here in St. George's Churchyard, along with his horse. Today, the streets of York still echo to the sounds of musicians and other street entertainers who delight the many visitors to this historic city. Throughout the centuries, York has played host to Romans 
Anglo-Saxons, Vikings and Normans. In the military, commercial, cultural and religious life of this country, it has played a major role. In the words of King George VI, the history of York is the history of England.